We all love a good superhero origin story. Sure, it's great to see Spider-Man swinging from buildings, but it was what Uncle Ben told a young Peter Parker that touched us all. We all love seeing Batman kicking the Joker's teeth in, but it's that tragic night in Crime Alley that we're still fascinated by. So it's no surprise that the first and greatest superhero of all time should have a TV show about what defined him. There is a reason why Clark Kent is the best of us. While Batman may be the ultimate example of physical perfection, Superman is the pinnacle of the goodness of humanity. But there has always been a debate among fans. Is Superman Clark Kent or is Clark Kent just a disguise? I have always argued Superman is just a cape and that Clark is the hero who wears it. Smallville is the case for my belief in what makes Superman the greatest superhero in the world. This series would follow a young Clark Kent's journey to becoming the savior of humanity, while on the flip side, we also got to see how one man could never escape his fate of becoming the world's most heinous criminal. Tragically, two friends would wind up on opposite sides of good and evil. But have I built this show up into some kind of forgotten masterpiece, or am I just drunk on kryptonite? Well, let us find out in this episode of Gone, but not forgotten. Smallville was developed by Alfred Goff and Miles Miller. The story of how Smallville was conceived was that WB president Peter Roth had been trying to create a Superboy TV show since 1979, which is what led him to commission a Superman origin TV show. Now I call shit on this. You see, there had already been a Superboy TV show that had aired in the late 80s and early 90s. I talked about it in the very first episode of Gone But Not Forgotten, so I'd suggest you check that one out if you're curious. What is true is that the original idea for WB superhero show was a pitch from Tim McCanley's that went by the title of Bruce Wayne. This would have been a Batman origin type of TV series. But this proposal was shot down, since Warner Brothers were trying to develop a new Batman movie and didn't want brand confusion. But the idea of an origin story caught on, and Roth approached the screenwriting and producing team of Alfred Goff and Miles Miller. The duo was trying to develop a TV adaptation of the Arnold Schwarzenegger film Eraser, but that project had been going nowhere, and they were intrigued by the idea of a Superman origin show. Goff and Miller were not comic fans, and were only casually familiar with the character. In an interview on the Inside of You podcast with Smallville star Michael Rosenbaum, Miller and Goff said they always wondered why Clark was so good, and that this question would serve as the central theme of the series. But they wanted to keep this show grounded, so they created the no tights and no flights rule which essentially meant they wanted to focus on the characters instead of the standard superhero fare. This was a bit controversial, and is still debated among fans on whether this was a mistake or not. I've personally always been on the fence about how much the source material should affect these projects. Sometimes it's a good thing to stray a bit from the source material, since the adaptations should focus on characters and plot. So sticking too close to the lore can just take away from that. A perfect example of this is Mortal Kombat Annihilation, where the movie is drowned in so much canon that it's barely a movie. But then you have a movie like Wanted, where the only connection to the Source comic was the title. So finding the right balance was key. But did Smallville find that balance? Well, before we get to that answer, let's get back to its origins. Casting the show would be especially essential to its success. The first person cast was Kristen Kruick, who hadn't been acting for very long. Her first role was in the teen soap opera Edgemont, and during that time she was also cast in the TV movie Snow White, the fairest of them all. This movie was sent to Goff and Miller during their search for who would play Lana Lang. They were immediately impressed and said that they should snatch her up before anyone else could. Kruick did what she could with this role. At first, Lana was an interesting character, her parents were killed in front of her during the meteor shower that brought Clark to Earth. She was portrayed as the perfect girl, the girl next door, the popular cheerleader with a heart of gold. But during the first season, we learn that she is just pretending. Deep down, she is just trying to please everyone. 
and trying to live up to what she thought her parents would want her to be. This is why she fell in love with Clark, because he saw the real her. Unfortunately, that was pretty much all this character had in her tank. Sadly, after a few seasons, Lana was just reduced to being a love interest, or rather, a prize. John Schneider was cast as Clark's dad, Jonathan Kent. This was a brilliant piece of casting, considering he had played the iconic southern bad boy, Bo Duke, in the Dukes of Hazard. It was completely believable that he would be a farmer. Schneider initially turned down Smallville three times, because he said, quote, I don't want to be part of what ruined the Superman legacy. But he changed his mind after reading the script. He loved that Jonathan wasn't an idiot like other father figures on television at the time. Schneider played Jonathan as a loving father, who would do anything for his son. But he wasn't perfect. He was overprotective of Clark and hated the Luthors. This was due to making a deal with Lionel Luthor to fake Clark's adoption. The price he ended up paying was betraying his friends, the Ross family. John said that his son helped shape how he portrayed the relationship between Jonathan and Clark. His son happens to have Asperger's syndrome and said that raising a child with special needs is a completely different life that many parents don't experience. He brought this awareness into how he saw Jonathan and Clark's relationship. I enjoyed the chemistry between him and Tom Welling. You could believe these two were father and son. They're responsible for many of my favorite scenes of the show. Annette O'Toole also had an interesting casting story. She wasn't cast as Martha Kent until after the pilot was shot. Originally, actress Cynthia Edinger was cast and shot the pilot, but the team felt that she wasn't working. She later said in interviews that they told her she was too young and it wasn't believable to see her as a mother. Annette O'Toole had just done a show called The Huntress that had recently been canceled, which had opened up for Goff and Miller to bring her onto the show. Annette is known to many Superman fans as being the first actress to ever portray Lana Lang in Superman 3. O'Toole is also a huge Superman fan, so she was thrilled to visit the world of the son of Krypton once again. Annette portrayed Martha Kent as a loving mother who was more open-minded than Jonathan, as she was willing to not judge Lex for the baggage of the Luthor name. O'Toole had an interesting take when it came to Martha's motivation. To quote her words from the season one companion for Smallville, I have the feeling that she didn't have a mother growing up. They've never introduced a mother to her. That's why being a mother is so important to her and being the picture book kind of mother at that. Like John Schneider, I think O'Toole's Martha Kent has been the best portrayal of this character. No offense to Diane Lane, I think she did a great job. But at least her Martha Kent was never used for one of the stupidest moments in comic book cinema. Save Martha! Both O'Toole and Schneider have said that many people from the military have approached them with gratitude. It turns out that many entertainment packages that had been sent to the troops overseas contain seasons of Smallville. So they've been told that the Kents were like their parents that were there with them during the hard times. Pete Ross was played by Sam Jones III. I think Jones got the short end of the stick on this series. He was Clark's best friend from childhood, but his character was never explored. For the first season, he had less screen time than Chloe Sullivan, who wasn't even a character from the comics. Sam was frustrated because of his character's lack of direction. Many fans were as well, and made their feelings known in letters and message boards. So the decision to have Pete learn Clark's secret was introduced. Jones thought that this would open up a new aspect of his character. Sadly, it was handled very poorly. It now became a storyline of Pete freaking out over how to keep Clark's secret. It was horrible. And it was the way that the character was written out of the show that hurt the most to Jones. In the ending of Pete's role on the series, he told Clark that he could no longer handle the burden of his double life. So he left Smallville at the end of season three. Miller said that they handled the exit of the character of Pete Ross poorly. At the time, they hoped to bring him back in later seasons. And this did happen, but in one of the stupidest episodes of the series. Allison Mack was cast as Chloe Sullivan, an original character for the show. Chloe was the Lois Lane stand-in and love rival to Lana. 
she got a lot of screen time and, ironically, better storylines than Lana ever did. She even had a web series during the run of the show. It's eventually revealed that she is the cousin of Lois Lane, and she winds up getting married to Jimmy Olsen. Then she's possessed by Brainiac and winds up marrying and becoming the mother of Green Arrow's son. I'm not kidding. This all actually happened. Allison Mack has become one of the most famous actors since this show ended. To everyone's dismay, it was for all the wrong reasons. Mack would become involved with a cult called Nixium, which would lead to her going to prison for 21 months. This was all chronicled in the award-nominated true crime HBO documentary series, The Vow. But back to the lighter side of things. Smallville couldn't have worked without Clark Kent, so they had to cast the perfect actor for this role. They did a nationwide search. Jensen Ackles was in serious consideration to play Clark, but instead they went with a relatively unknown actor. Enter Tom Welling. Tom had originally started out as a model, who would transition into acting. He was in a few episodes of Judging Amy and small roles on other shows. Welling turned down the role twice, because he felt that the idea sounded silly and was worried about being typecast. But like John Schneider, he was convinced after reading the script for the pilot. Tom Welling brought the best part of Clark Kent, his innate goodness. He saw the best in people, even Lex Luthor. Much of the show would have Clark struggling with his identity, trying to learn his origins while holding on to his humanity. Welling did a great job of portraying such a struggle, but it was the relationship between Clark and his best friend that kept viewers coming back for more. Lex and Clark were, of course, tragically destined to become bitter enemies for all time. And this is where we come to the other star of the show, Lex Luthor, played by Michael Rosenbaum. It's no secret that Rosenbaum was the breakout star of this show. The majority of comic fans all say that he is the definitive Lex Luthor. I would have to agree. Gene Hackman was great, but his Lex Luthor was a buffoon obsessed with real estate. Sherman Howard was a great mad scientist Lex Luthor. John Cryer was a great criminal mastermind Lex Luthor. Eh, pass. And Jesse Eisenberg was... Boys! Mm. Bruce Wayne meets Clark Kent. Ah, I love it. I love bringing people together. Hi, hello, Lex, it is a pleasure. Ow, wow, that is a good grip. You should not pick a fight with this person. Well, that was a choice. But Michael Rosenbaum just oozed this charisma, intelligence, and surprising vulnerability on screen. Why can't you just walk away from your father? Because he won't give me the only thing I've ever wanted from him. And that would be? I want him to love me. Like the Silver Age comics, Lex and Clark would start out as friends, but slowly their friendship would turn into bitterness and hatred. It's funny because Michael Rosenbaum was the last person to be cast on this show. Not only that, but he bombed at his first audition. He said that he didn't take it seriously, he didn't learn his lines, and it was a complete disaster. But like so many other actors on the cast, he thought that a Superman TV show would be a joke. But two months later, they called him back to audition again. This time, his agent convinced him that this was going to be a more grounded show, and not an over-the-top superhero cheese fest. So he learned his lines, went in, and said to himself, If I fail, then I fail. Afterward, the network wanted him to meet the producers and audition again. But this time, Rosenbaum refused. He told them that if they liked what they saw on the tape, they could hire him and if they wanted to pass, then that was fine. He got the role. A great aspect of Lex's life was his relationship with his father, Lionel Luthor. Lionel was played by the amazing John Glover. John has been working in the entertainment industry for decades. I have been a huge fan of his ever since he played the devil on Brimstone. That's another great show that was canceled far too soon. But the best parts of the series were the scenes between him and the lead actor, Peter Horton. But many of you may remember him from such classic movies as Gremlins 2, Scrooged, and Batman and Robin. John is an A-list star who deserves to get some recognition. The man is a master of both comedy and drama, which is not an easy thing to do for many actors. John played Lionel like a complete bastard. 
But he wasn't a cartoonish villain. Like all the best bad guys, he thought that he was the good guy. In Lionel's twisted mind, he thought that his motivations were pure. Lionel Luthor thought that Lex was weak and that he needed to mold his son. So instead of compassion, he gave Lex punishment. Lionel was only supposed to be a guest star in the show, but John was so good that they made him a regular. Originally, the creators had tried to get William H. Macy to take the role, but I can't see anyone else's Lionel but John Glover. So now that we've gone over the characters, let's get on to the show by looking at the infamous pilot episode. The basic premise of the show is that when Clark arrives on Earth, he is not alone. Pieces of the planet Krypton have followed him, and in a brilliant bit of writing, end up obscuring his ship. This was great because it was always such a big plot hole in the comics and films that the government did not see the ship crash with its current technology. But the destruction that the meteor shower rains on Smallville would lead to an immense irrational guilt. Lana's parents died, Lex would lose his hair, and people were mutated into kryptonite freaks. This last bit was probably the worst part of the show. The Freak of the Week episodes. The one aspect of Smallville that was always used to put down this show. And I get it. This was the early days of the DVR, and streaming was not even something anyone could even dream of. Not everyone saw the pilot, so you had to hook people in with a gimmick. But Jesus, some of these episodes were so stupid. I mean, Kryptonite would be used for anything. Here are such a few examples. It was used as a smoothie that would make you lose weight and turn into a monster that ate human fat. It would also turn you into a movie star who would later come back into the DC Universe, but that's another story. It would make flowers produce oils to make you invisible. Kryptonite was used to make gasoline for Fast and the Furious drag races. It was used to make gum, which would give you stretchy powers. It was the fountain of youth. It could turn you into a human insect. It just went on and on. By the way, maybe I'm not remembering this correctly, but why didn't the government investigate and capture these kryptonite freaks? I know that Luthor Corps did, but did no one in the government decide to pass by and pick up some rocks? Please let me know if I'm wrong because I do not remember this being featured on the show. But even though we had those negative aspects of the series, there were many things that kept me watching. Characters' relationships were the best part of the show. The friendship between Clark and Lex wasn't the only one that would end up being explored. Jonathan's mistrust of Lex because of his father, Martha trying to bring out the lightness in Lionel, and the mind games between Lex and Lionel were just some of the standouts. It's just a shame that for all that good, there was a lot of bad. Some storylines just left me scratching my head, like making Lana and Lex a couple. I don't get why they couldn't just be friends. Also, am I the only one who thought it was weird that Lex hung out with teenagers? But one of the worst storylines was Chloe and Jimmy Olsen's relationship and their eventual marriage and divorce. It ended with Jimmy dying after he saves her from Doomsday. Oh, and get this, it's revealed that his name isn't Jimmy. It's Henry James Olsen. Jimmy is just a nickname. The real Jimmy Olsen is his baby brother. I know some of you may have thought that plot twist was okay or even good, but I'm sorry, I just thought it was ridiculous. There were also episodes that were just blatant ripoffs. One episode that comes to mind was one where Clark and the crew get trapped by a serial killer who used elaborate death traps, very similar to the Saw movies. Another had Clark and his friends getting drunk off magical wine in Vegas, which was blatantly a ripoff of The Hangover. This was a common problem with Smallville. Many arcs on the show were dumb, and a lot of these storylines would be resolved very clumsily. I always felt like this was because an idea was introduced without thinking about how they would resolve it. It felt like the writers were saying to each other, don't worry, we'll fix it in post. The biggest example was the conclusion to Clark and Lana's relationship. The problem was that Lois Lane ended up getting introduced in Season 4, and Erica Durance just blew everyone away in the part. She played the perfect Lois Lane, sarcastic, funny, brave, and a pain in the ass to Clark. Those early episodes of hers were great, and the chemistry between Tom Welling and Erica Durance was off the charts. 
it was a real treat to see them slowly going from hating each other to falling in love. The issue is that the show was actually built on the relationship between Lana and Clark, but it was always destined to end, and the writers had painted themselves in a corner. Instead of slowly having Clark and Lana move on from each other, the writers decided to cram it into one episode. The brilliant move was that Lana gets superpowers, then has to stop a kryptonite bomb by absorbing the kryptonite into her body. Because of this, if Clark comes near her, he will die. I was shocked that this was the best that they could come up with. It was the equivalent of someone trying to write their homework at the last minute. Still, some of the cooler stuff on the show was the comic book material that was used. It started with the episode Hourglass, where we see a vision of Lex's future as president. When Impulse is introduced in the episode Run, it ends with an awesome race between Clark and Bart. Another great episode was Aqua, which introduced Aquaman. Amen. Both the Wonder Twins and the Legion of Superheroes would show up in some of my favorite episodes of the entire series. But one of the best episodes was the Season 6 episode called Justice, which introduced the Justice League. It's just sad that Batman, Wonder Woman, and Green Lantern couldn't be used due to a variety of reasons. Another great aspect of the show was the love that it had for the classic Superman the movie from 1978. Many of that movie's cast would come back for this show. You had Mark McClure, who played Jimmy Olsen in the four original Superman movies, returning as a lost Kryptonian living on Earth. He played Dax Orr, the Kryptonian creator of Brainiac in Season 7. But the most famous moment of the show was when the best Superman ever, Christopher Reeve, guest starred as Dr. Virgil Swan, a scientist who would help Clark learn more about his Kryptonian heritage. This was the most talked about moment on TV that year. I remember that it was all that anyone could talk about at my comic book shop back home. Tom Welling said that Reeve was amazing to work with, and it was an honor to be in the same room with him, as he explains in an episode of his podcast, Talkville. The idea was we were going to film Chris talking to me, and then he was going to be allowed or to go. Right. He wasn't going to stay there for my my coverage, which if anybody make you know two actors talk to each other, sometimes one actor leaves, and the other one stays. It doesn't happen. Anyway, Chris wouldn't leave, and I think it was six or seven hours later that his nurse said to him, "If you're," because she kept saying, "You got to leave. It's time for us to leave." Because they, you know, it's his dangerous. condition is dangerous for him. And she, I remember her saying, if you don't leave, I'm calling the police. It was a blast to work with him. I mean, just look at this cute PSA that Tom and Chris did together. Please help us conquer paralysis. Call the Chris Free Paralysis Foundation at 1-800-225-0292. Or visit the CRPF website at chrisforreeve.org. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please. Please call. <laughs> But the same cannot be said for everyone from the classic film. Margot Kidder guest starred in a few episodes, and was supposed to have had a bigger role in the series. There was a rumor that she was supposed to be the main villain of season 4, but sadly, we will never know, because Kidder was not happy with the producers. When Reeve passed away, they wanted her character to talk about Dr. Swan dying. In an interview with the Superman homepage in February 2005, Margot said, quote, I thought it was quite exploitative, and I said so, but they, the producers, didn't see it that way. I mean, Christopher was my friend, so to go on and do a scene where I announce his death on Smallville so that they can get publicity, it just seemed to me to be exploitative, personally. Probably didn't to other people, and so it just didn't work. If you're going to get me to be exploitative, you're gonna have to pay me an awful lot of money. So her character would end up being killed off screen. Still, it was nice to see Margot back in the Superman mythos again, even if it was just for a little bit of time. Plus, they also used the classic John Williams Superman score quite a bit in the series, which is always nice to hear. One thing you can't especially forget about Smallville is its theme song, Save Me, by the now-defunct band Remy Zero. This song will forever be associated with the Superman legacy. It was even featured later on the Arrowverse show, Supergirl. 
but in Season 7, Goff and Miller would leave the series. Although it's never been explicitly said why they left, many comments indicate that they had always wanted just five seasons of the show, but the network wanted to stretch it out as long as possible. Michael Rosenbaum also left that season because he wanted to move on, and felt that once Goff and Miller left, it wasn't worth sticking around. He did come back in the finale, but he said he did it just for the fans. Still, even though it was great to see him on the show again, you can tell his appearance was a complete rush job. So at the time, the show was hit or miss. But this all changed with season 10, which steered hard into the comic book content. This season featured a lot of comic book characters being introduced to TV for the first time. Booster Gold and Blue Beetle were two of the most memorable. Season 10 was generally thought to be the best of the series but the finale would wind up being controversial. By this point in the series, Brian Peterson and Kelly Souders had taken over showrunner duty, and while some people hate the ending of the show, while some people love the ending, my personal biggest issue was seeing Clark finally don the suit. We only got to see him do the classic opening of his shirt to reveal the S symbol, and with CGI Clark flying in the dark. According to an article on Screen Rant published in August 2017, Peterson said, quote, What we wanted to do all along was show hints at where he, Superman, was going, because that is a whole different story that has yet to be told. It felt like it gave just enough without starting to tell a whole different story that is left for all the other media. Right. So, should Smallville come back? Well, technically it did. DC released a series of comics called Smallville Season 11, published between 2013 to 2016, and during the Crisis of Infinite Earths Arrowverse event, we got to visit Smallville again. The scene between Tom Welling and John Cryer was my favorite of the entire event. I especially loved this line. <clears throat> That's kryptonite. Which has no effect on me ever since I gave up my powers. You gave up? Your powers? Can't say I missed these chats. You were recently, Willing and Rosenbaum said that an animated Smallville series was being developed, but sadly, Rosenbaum said at a convention that James Gunn had shot the idea down for now. Still, he said that he would pursue it in a few years when things settled down in the DC universe. Hopefully, something may change in the future. In the meantime, Rosenbaum and Willing started a podcast called Talkville where they rewatch the show and tell stories of their experiences filming Smallville. It's not a bad podcast app playing in the background while you do errands. Currently, you can see all 10 seasons of Smallville on Hulu, so I recommend you take a trip down to that iconic farm to watch some of Superman's incredible early adventures. Just make sure you watch out for that pesky kryptonite. Jesse Shade speaking on behalf of David Arroyo for JoeBlow.com, and thanks again for watching our show. If you like what you see, please subscribe to the Joe Blow Originals channel, tell all your friends who like this sort of content, and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all our latest videos. We are an independent company that appreciates all of your support, and we will see you next time for the next episode of Gone, but Not Forgotten. Sorry. <laughs>